Risk assessment frameworks uh, to guide cumulative effects management uh, has been presented, uh, co-presented today uh, by Fabrice uh, Stevenson uh, from the University of Waikato and Sean Awatere uh, from Manaki Whenua uh, theme leader Tangaroa. Uh, Sean is from Ngāti Parau. is based at Manaki Whenua and his research involves the incorporation of Māori values into economic decision making, enabling Māori organisations to make more kaupapa Māori attuned decisions. For the challenge, he leads the Tangaroa programme and co leads a project on the perceptions of risk and uncertainty. Fabrice is a quantitative marine ecologist at the University of Waikato. His research is primarily focused on understanding spatial patterns of biodiversity at different spatial scales and how these can be affected by human activities. Fabrice and Joanne Ellis uh, co-lead the Sustainable Seas Project, communicating risk and uncertainty to aid decision making. Uh, welcome uh, you both here um, and welcome up here to the platform. Ki te kore te tangata e Jackie, tō tātou nei taio, ka kore te tangata e Fai Oranga. Uia mai ki a hau, hea ha te mea nui o te ao, māku e ki atu ko te tai ao, ko te tai ao, ko te tai ao. O rei rā, ki ora tātou. Ka tautoko a hau, ngā mihi kua mihia, reri atu ngā mihi ki a ki tō tātou Papa Joe, Nā nā nō, i whakapai tō tātou nei hui. O si rā kia koutou ngā kaitiaki, koutou e tiaki ngā taonga tukui ho, hei oranga mō tātou, hei oranga hoki mā ngā uri whakatipu, nei rā te mihi atu kia koutou. Kia koutou hoki, ko tae mai nei, i rongi te karangatanga te wā, ki te tautoko tēnei kaupapa o te au o te moana, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko ai a hau, he uri tēnei, nō te tai rāwhiti, Nō Ngāti Iwe Pōhatu, nō Ngāti Pōrau, ko Sean Awatere ahau, nō reira e te whanaunga pāhia, nō reira e te whanaunga pāhia, tēnā koe. O te rā, kia ora koutou katoa. So, Fabrice and I are going to do a bit of a tag team effort today. I'm going to talk about the, the very interesting social science part, and then Fabrice is going to come in with the, the technocratic uh, perspective. <laughs> I just want to start off, I'll give you an example around people have different perceptions and different ideas around how the world works. And risk and uncertainty is probably the dominant framework, the dominant underpinning for how we make decisions and determining what gets allocated and what gets looked after in terms of natural resource management. It's, it's come about because of the dominance of legal frameworks and economic frameworks that provides this type of way of looking and assessing what matters. And I think that we, if we look about, if you think about what's happened over the past couple of days, we've had a number of kōrero, we've had people talk about the role of markets, the role of economics and finance for helping us to manage natural resources. Yesterday we had our kaitiaki talk about that particular whakaro and worldview about how we look after the environment. And I think, uh, like, here's a novel idea in terms of addressing oceans policy. Why don't we tax those who create those negative externalities? Why don't we tax those who create pollution? Why don't we tax those who leave all their forestry slash on our beaches? But you might say, oh, no, we can't do that. That will scare away our investors. But I think if we make a transition towards thinking about those companies and those organisations that are more values-based, the agri seas, the Moana New Zealand, those are the type of uh, businesses that I think are going to support a truly inclusive oceans policy. So we've got to think about what are the, the ways that we can include those types of whakaro in the way that we make decisions. So let's go through, let's step through an example, I'll go through it pretty quickly. So we've got a, an advisory group that's advising the oceans policy. 
And in this uh, advisory group, we might have the lay person director, you might have the professional director, you might have a policy nerd like myself, or you might have uh, a scientific nerds. Yeah, that's most of you guys out there. And you might have also have the, the kaitiaki as well. They're all part of an advisory group that are helping to inform the ocean's policy. And they have to present their case <clears throat> as a technical advisory group to decision makers. They might be uh, the officials at MB, MFE, MPI, or might be to the ministers. And they each come from different world views, Kaitiaki view, the MBA, Harvard MBA people, and then you've got the people who are wanting to transition to something that's more in tune with enhancing the mana or te tail, enhancing our environment. And then you also got your different disciplinary training. You've got a very you know, technocratic, reductionist worldviews, and then you've got more holistic worldviews. So the big question is, how do you reconcile all these different worldviews in order to make something that's truly inclusive with respect to oceans policy. Within that context sits Te Tiriti and co-governance. So there's some key levers there that are driving us towards transitioning to a partnership approach that needs to be inclusive of these different worldviews. So in terms of the perceptions of risk and uncertainty project, we've created a number of resources that helps decision makers, it helps policy analysts step through some of those types of decisions in terms of unpacking the worldview, understanding the biases, understanding the position that you have, but then also providing some diagnostic tools or a rubric that can measure how you're actually transitioning towards partnership. Are you really including mana whenua voices in the, in the policy development process? Are you actually empowering and providing resources to mana whenua to participate in an equitable manner, manner in the development of their policy? I'll leave it there and I'll hand it over to Fabrice and I'll wrap it up at the end in terms of our kaupapa. So kia ora. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Ko Fabrice toko um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in Project 3.2, which I co-lead with my wonderful colleague, Joanne Ellis. Uh, and our, our mahi is focused really on, on methods and frameworks for, for assessing risk, specifically risk arising from multiple and cumulative impacts. Um, so really, in, you know, within the kind of the challenge framework, we're focused on, on assessments that can, that can support EBM, but also the needs and aspirations of Māori. And so the, the first step that we took was to undertake a, a review of current risk assessment methods um, currently used in Aotearoa and we assess their relevance for EBM against these 12 um, criteria that we've come up with. And just building on um, some of the work uh, that Sean and colleagues have done in Project 3.1, I want to draw your attention to, to the top three criteria uh, on the screen there, which we think are particularly uh, relevant within this context. So can these risk assessments uh, include multiple values? Uh, do they account for multiple ecosystem components? And, and do they allow the incorporation of multiple knowledge types? So really, these are things that we um, would advocate are crucial within this EBM context, and also supporting um, the needs and aspirations of Māori. So key messages from this literature review um, was that risk assessments are still often done with one stressor affecting one response, when really we've had a lot of talks today where we understand that there's a real need to understand cumulative effects and how multiple stresses can affect multiple uh, components of the ecosystem. That risk assessments that can account for ecological complexity are likely to be more successful. So very, very um, simple models uh, can have their place, but of course uh, ecology is very complex and so methods that can account for that um, do better or fare better within that EBM context. But also building on a lot of the work that's been undertaken in Project 1.1, and, and Rebecca gave a really good overview of this in her last talk. Um, it's around risk assessments that can account for implications of management actions. So at what point do we need to do certain management actions? How does that affect our risk and our uncertainty, and ultimately the outcome in terms of um, you know, managing our, our ecosystem sustainably? So very aspirational, really, um, and a big, a big undertaking, and we found that 
you know, multiple tools and approaches would be needed, that there isn't a silver bullet, uh, but there are certain tools that, that um, address certain of those criteria, more, more, than, more than a few, I guess. So what we have done as part of um, some of the synthesis uh, work at the end of this project is to, to summarize some of those considerations into decision trees. So um, you know, different tools have different strengths, different weaknesses, and so we can summarize this based on certain attributes to try and help people decide uh, which kind of tools they may want to use and, and what benefits they may get out of it. I'm not going to go into detail in this. Um, there, there's a, maybe a link in a slides time which uh, will point you to, to some guidance documents and, and also the wider outputs from Project 3.2. But at this stage, I do want to acknowledge that we've, we've tested a number of these tools, including within phase one. So this project here really building on a lot of um, excellent work that was undertaken in phase one of Sustainable Seas. A different way of, of looking at that decision tree is to kind of look at it this way. Um, we have a selection of tools. It doesn't really matter what the acronyms mean. Um, what, what I want you to focus on is, is two of the key components that we think are really important for this risk assessment. The fact that they can account for multiple worldviews and they can incorporate cumulative effects. And so you can see that not all tools do this. Some tools do it better than others. Um, some of these also can include multiple types of evidence. So tools um, that can use different types of evidence but also can work in low data situations, which is um, can often be the case, and so when we have high uncertainty, how do we make decisions? Um, but equally, um, in terms of being able to communicate the outputs, it's really uh, important that they're, that they're um, understandable. So I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about a couple of the case studies that we've done. It's a very high-level overview. Um, the first case study uses a Bayesian network tool uh, and was a collaborative uh, project with Project T1, Afimai Afiatu. Richard Bulmer um, leading this, this work here, so if you have any questions, please feel free to bug him at the, at the session. So just a bit of context, obviously, um, we've heard a lot about cumulative impacts and, and, and how they've affected the ecosystem. You know, here where there's been a really strong decline in, in muscle densities over the last 20 plus years, and the iwi have led uh, a strong effort in this space to, to try and come up with some muscle restoration approaches. And so we fed into this, uh, we co-developed a tool that would try and help inform muscle restoration efforts and also assess kind of the risk and uncertainty associated with hypothetical management interventions. So what is this tool? It combines a couple of things. It combines a species distribution model that allows us to, to predict where we think the best places might be for muscle densities. And it combines a network model, a Bayesian network. And this allows us to bring in some of the management interventions, but also some parts uh, of the system that we have less information on, we can, we can bring in a greater amount of uncertainty uh, and still account for that and not just ignore it. Um, a key point here is that in both of those models that were eventually combined, um, quantitative data sets were used for those. We went out to the field and, and did muscle surveys and collected uh, mud samples and, and all the other things that we think drive muscle density. But throughout the process, um, we, were, we were weaving in matauranga. So deciding where we were going to sample um, in terms of thinking about what was uh, likely to be driving the decline in the muscle densities and also bringing in some of those uh, less well understood um, relationships between the predator-prey interactions that we think are happening, which um, you know, the local iwi and the Ohiwa implementation forum uh, had a lot of uh, knowledge of. And so we're able to bring these two streams together and start testing some management scenarios. Um, again, I don't have a lot of time. We did find a lot of things, but um, a couple of highlights is that um, we're able to really drill down into thinking about what may drive successful restoration, but also highlighting a lot of the uncertainty in some of these key ecological interactions. And, and that'll have uh, you know, two ramifications. The first is it's going to hopefully inform ongoing field experiments, so kind of provide a bit more of a focused approach to, to where we're missing some of that information but hopefully it will also support management decisions in the face of uncertainty, because in many cases, you know, in complex systems, we won't have all the answers, and, and we do need tools that provide uh, at least indications of, of what we might want to, to do. So we're really excited by this approach, this hybrid approach, which we think is, is really suitable for this kind of EBM approach um, of kind of weaving in Mātauranga Māori and Western science into, into a single risk assessment tool. And we think this really fits within the ethos of EBM of supporting inclusive decision making. Um, so again, please feel free to talk to us at the, at the break about this. 
The second case study builds on a lot of work that um, Rebecca presented, and so this should hopefully be relatively familiar at this stage, but we're taking some of her principles and thinking about how that affects risk. So Rebecca talked a lot about the different aspects that go into, into how ecosystems respond to stress, and then we're taking it a little step further in terms of thinking about uh, what is the risk and what's the management risk, and specifically thinking about um, at what point uh, do management interventions have the greatest effect. So Rebecca showed some of those graphs with uh, different interventions over time and what we think might be happening with the ecosystem state. We're bringing this into a, into a risk assessment, which um, can be viewed in a network. I like networks. Um, but, but they can also be viewed in this, in this kind of space here. I'll just give a couple of examples um, where we might have uh, a, a site in an estuary, for example, that has a certain ecosystem state. And that's driven, of course, by the amount of stress that it experiences, but also um, the ecology that's there in place. And we can track how that site changes over time in terms of its ecosystem health. Uh, and in this particular scenario, we can see a very rapid decline at, at time point two, which would indicate some tipping point. So again, just a very small incremental increase in stress can result in a really large change in terms of the ecosystem state. And the advantage of this kind of principle-based tool is that we can run hundreds of scenarios and we can see how different management interventions might, might affect those rates of change. Uh, and thinking a little less negatively about always impacts, thinking about restoration or recovery, um, we can look at how sites can increase in their ecosystem state over time. And as Rebecca um, described in her talk really very well, there are certain times where that ecosystem state might not increase at all, and, and despite a reduction, for example, in, in the stressor state. So this kind of tool allows us to explore uh, in this kind of principle-based way how different interventions might actually increase that ecosystem state. And again, I'd encourage you to go talk to Rebecca and, and Jasmine um, about, about some of the um, details of, of these approaches. Back to you, Sean. Kia ora, Noah. So I think if we want to develop a marine or oceans policy that is going to create synergistic livelihoods rather than monopolistic hoodwinks, then I think we've got to unpack and recognize that we all got different positions. We all believe that science is the way to go. People have a profit is the way to go. Whakamana te taiao is the way to go. And we've got to come together and reconcile those different differences. And I think we've got some resources, we've got some tools that help people unpack those differences, that unpack the, the positions that we carry, and also unpack some of the disciplinary training, our indoctrination in science, our indoctrination in MBAs. And if we're able to do that, then I think that we can create a, a more in tuned oceans policy or ecosystem-based management process in conjunction with Te Ao Māori that are going to lead to better outcomes, not only for us, but for Mungā Uri Whakatipi, for those future generations. So downstairs, we've got our poster, and it provides a bit of more detail on what we have uh, been doing. And then also, Fabrice, uh, uh, 3.1 and 3.2, both projects are working on developing some guidance that provide that overarching context in terms of the understanding or perceptions of risk and uncertainty and some of the tools that help process the risk and uncertainty from a, from a technical perspective. Koe anoi hekama, nei rātei mihi mai oha kia koutou, kia ora anoa koutou katoa.